Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. To me, there is something very difficult about someone I love leaving this earth. I uh, was talking to my pastor this morning, and I was talking how my friend, Pastor Pat Dubois, passed away, and my friend uh, uh, Bishop Miller, you know, went on. And to me, they, they all went on too early. Uh, I was made connection with a guy named uh, Miles Monroe, who was extremely popular, and uh, he died in a plane crash. I loved Keith Green when I was a, a young believer in Christ, and he died young in a plane crash. You know, and it just it's a diff it's difficult to me to be here to know that there's certain that have left. And even though I'm I know I'm going to see them again, the rush of emotions can at times drive me to a depression. And I want to do something other then patiently wait. How many love waiting? Waiting is one of the most difficult things, I believe, for a believer to do. Because we know and believe that God's going to do something, but we wonder when. But my blessing after 40 years is knowing that this week I talked to my brother who went to church last Sunday. Now listen, 20 years ago, I actually led my brother to Christ. Since then, he's had a, a fight I mean, it's just been up and down. It's been a struggle and a fight. But now uh, he told me this week, and he, even Pastor Joseph heard it, in the most clarity that I've heard him speak because so many things have changed in his life. And he said, man, I'm listening to uh, the Bible now on uh, CD, you know, and, and I'm thinking, is this Jimmy? Is this really my long-haired hippie freak brother? Who's been smoking weed since he's 14, who's now 61. Is this really him? And, I, and, and I, I'm not downplaying or up, up. It's the weed is not what really hurt him. It's the other stuff that's really kicked his butt in life. And uh, so it just really hits me, you know, uh, to see what God is doing. But I've waited 40 years for this to happen. Now, let me ask you, how many have waited and prayed for your family and believe God that something was going, yeah, so I'm in the right place. Acts chapter 1, are you comfortable? Okay, what we just did, we finished Jesus on the road to Emmaus, meeting with two disciples from last week. We back up some. We've met Jesus at the cross. We've talked about the sayings at the cross. We walked in from the guest chamber in John chapter 13. So we're, well, I'm backing up here, regressing to let you know. But now he has resurrected from the grave. And he's going to spend 40 days. 40 days is a month and 10 days for those of you who went to A&M. I want you to know that it's important that it just, that seems like such a long time. But 40 days, he showed himself to people. He went around and connected with people. And then we find him in Acts chapter 1. And you think after, now you don't realize after 40 days, he may not, he may just stay right here. He may have resurrected and stay right here with us in a resurrected body. But he decided, no, I've got to give instructions and tell you what to do and what I need you to do. And then in Acts chapter 1, he says, uh, and this is what we believe what we would call uh, the man known as Luke, wrote in my former book, he's writing here, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. Mm. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his sufferings, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Showed his hands, walked through walls, uh, ate on the riverside, I mean on the, uh, the side of the, uh, the seaside. Uh, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And again, let me say, he didn't speak about heaven. Well, we know it's heaven, but we also know it's the kingdom. Amen. When we leave here, we're going to the king's domain. And the king has something for his uh, ambassadors to do. Can I get an amen? So it's important for you to, to start getting that inside your spirit. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Everybody say wait. For the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, 
For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will ba he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, this is important because in their mind, they saw him coming as a lion and that he was going to restore Israel. And that was a big deal to, of course, the Jewish uh, nation there. And he didn't come as a lion. He came as a lamb. When he comes back again, he's coming as a lion. Amen? Very important to understand that. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the dates the Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I wish I could wash your mind of everything you've ever thought of about the Holy Ghost. Because what has happened, there's been such a distortion in the body of Christ. We have seen such weird stuff take place in Pentecostal and charismatic movements. Wouldn't it be great for you just to understand that there's a Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that the, the, the Father, that Jesus testified about the Father, the Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus, and Jesus was cool with the Spirit of God, and that when the Spirit of God comes on you, you'll receive power. And I know many of you, you you've gone to churches, and you, you sound like a turkey farm. And you come to the front of an, uh, an altar, and they lay hands on you, and they shake your head, and, and they wave your hand, and, and they tell you, you got it, turn, turn loose, let go, turn loose, let go, turn loose, let go, hold on, let go, hold on, let go. You don't know whether to hold on or let go. I'm telling you because I've been there. I've preached in all these churches. But if I could just understand one thing, he said, wait until you be endued with power from on high. And many times we don't wait. We think it's got to take place in a church service sometime. I was filled with the Holy Ghost just waiting on God. Amen. I waited from 11 o'clock at night to 5 o'clock in the morning in prayer. And God filled me that night or the early that morning along with three other people. Scared all of us because we didn't know what was happening. I wasn't brought up knowing any of this stuff. But it scared me because uh, I was told my whole life you, you, people that speak in tongues were kind of like full of the devil. How can you be full of the devil? You're full of the Spirit. But the thing that happened to me wasn't the tongues. The thing that happened to me was love. That God filled me with love and forgiveness for people that I hated. It, it was a shift inside my spirit. And when that took place, I knew how real God was becoming more in my life. He was already real, but now he's becoming real, real. Amen. So Jesus said, I want you all to wait until you get, get power. Now, after this, he said he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Oh, hold on. I went too far. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my what? You'll be my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. This house is Jerusalem. Then he goes on to say, not only Jerusalem, but to all Judea, that'd be Houston, Samaria, that's Texas, and all the ends of the earth. So it starts here, and it moves out from here. Like this is kind of like our epicenter. Can I get an amen? Amen. After he said that, he was taken up before their eyes, and the cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Then suddenly, here it is again, two men dressed in white stood beside them. I'm thinking they're angels. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem. Then the hill called the Mount of Olives. A seventh day's walk from the city. It was about five-eighths of a mile. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter. John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayers among the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. Do you, do you recognize that on the day of Pentecost that Mary, Jesus' mother, was there? And that Jesus' brothers? Everybody say brothers? His brothers. That means Mary had children? Just saying. Let that shake you up a little bit. But they were all waiting because he made a promise that a gift was coming. Father, I thank you for your word. Anoint my lips to share your word. Let me push this through into the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name, everybody sit. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to preach to you a thought I'm leaving. 
Everybody say, I'm leaving. Do you know one day we all leaving? Amen. We all getting on up out of here. That's, that's country. We all getting up out of here. Amen. I'm leaving. Amen. But you wait here. And that's the hardest part. I'm leaving, but you wait here. You got to wait right here while I go there. And they've been with him for three years, but now he's moving. Now, the scripture starts off with, with about a man named Theophilus that, that Luke was speaking to. The name comes from two Greek words, theos and philio. Theos means God, philio means lover. So that Luke is writing to all lovers of God. If you're a lover of God, you're going to love the book of Acts. The idea that the book was written to all the lovers of God and his ministry was touching and telling. It said everything Jesus both did and said. Everything, Jesus was so simple. So simple. We make this thing too hard. Jesus' whole ministry was wrapped up in two words, touching and telling. That's it. Sometimes he knew when to touch. Sometimes he knew when to talk. We got to learn when to talk and when to hush up. When to touch, when to hug somebody, embrace somebody, shake their hand, eat man, or connect with them. That's important to know. But that's all Jesus did. If you study his whole ministry, those are the things that he's doing. Waiting. But he said, wait here. Waiting on the Lord may be one of the most difficult aspects of the believer's life. When Jesus promised that he would return, he instructed his followers to wait. That's easier said than done. So what do we do in the meantime? What do we do when we wait? This message hopefully is going to help you. And by the way, the whole issue to me of the book of Acts is an intimacy or relationship with Jesus. God wants all of us to have a relationship with him. Just a, a simple relationship, talking with him, getting to know him. Uh, we use the word intimate. It just simply means because I just want to get to know him personally. I, I, don't want to, I don't want pastor's faith. I don't want Joseph's faith. I want my faith to connect with Jesus. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. All right? Everybody good with that? Okay. Uh, so, so first off, so what's waiting? Waiting on the Lord requires patient trust. Waiting means that we give God the benefit of a doubt and that he knows what he's doing. I got to wait. I know he knows what he's doing. I got to believe that. Waiting is God's way of seeing if we will trust him before we move forward. Many times we want to move too quick. Waiting on God reminds us. Right now I'm just telling you. Then I'm going to tell you what I'm, what I'm going to tell you. Waiting on God reminds us that God is in control. Waiting reminds me that I am not in charge. Aren't you glad you're not in charge? You know when Adam finally decided, uh, you know, I'm going to take the fruit and become God because that's what the devil told me to do. He realized he couldn't handle the pressure. You, I want to tell you something. You can't handle the pressure of being God either. You can't do it. You've got to wait on him. Waiting reminds me that I am not God. Waiting on the Lord allows God to do his work. God's timing is always best. He's never late. God is working. Waiting on God increases my strength. If I wait on him, I'll get stronger. No one likes to wait, but we wait in traffic. Carpool lines, holding patterns in grocery stores for the foursome ahead of us that keep looking for their lost ball, for the doctor, for a woman. Waiting. Wait on the baby to come. Wait for retirement. Waiting for pastor to get on preaching. <laughs> We're waiting on Jesus' return. Can I get an Amen. We are not patient. A woman's car stalled in traffic. She looked in vain under the hood to identify the cause while the driver behind her kept leaning relentlessly on his horn. Finally, she had enough. She walked back to his car, amen, knocked on his window and offered sweetly. She said, I don't know what the matter of my car is, but if you want to go look under the hood, I'll be glad to stay here and honk the horn for you. We all hate waiting. Waiting is not just something we have to do while we get what we want. Waiting is the process of becoming what God wants us to be. What God does in us while we wait is important as what it is we are waiting for. Waiting biblically is not a passive waiting around for something to happen. Matter of fact, Jesus said, occupy till I come. Keep doing something, amen, for the glory of God. But, but pay attention here. For something to happen that will allow us to escape our troubles, that's it. Waiting does not mean doing nothing. It is not a fatal, 
uh, fatalistic resignation. I'm just going to give up. No, that's not waiting. It's not a way to evade unpleasant reality. Those who wait are those who work because they know their work is not in vain. The farmer can wait all summer for his harvest because he has done his work of sowing the seed and watering the plants. And those who wait on God can go about their assigned ta uh, task confident that God will provide the meaning and conclusion. I've watched this garden we've got going out at the ranch and I keep driving by waiting on something to come up. Nothing there yet, but it's going to happen. Kenny, I believe in them because y'all been out there working. But eventually the waiting, because you're going to be waiting toward the end of the summer. So waiting on the Lord requires patient trust. We live by the adage, don't just stand there, do something. Well, God often says to us, don't just do something, stand there. After you've done all to stand, stand. Stay put. Amen. Waiting means that we give God the benefit of the doubt that he knows what he's doing. Waiting is God's way of seeing if we will trust him before we move forward. That trust is a patient trust, whether it has to do with our relationships, our finances, our careers, our dreams, our churches. We have to trust that God knows what he's doing. Waiting on God reminds us that he's in control. Whew. Sometimes people ask, but what, what do I do while I'm waiting? That's a good question. During those waiting times, take on an active role of a watchman. Again, look at this scripture, and I, I found it several times in the Bible. Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. I put my hope in his word. When you believe God for something, you've got to put your hope there and hold on to it. Amen. You, you won't be put to shame if you hold on to it. In biblical times, a watchman vigilantly guarded the city. They watched for enemies who might attack at night, and they waited for the sun to come up. They were alert and obedient, ready to respond when needed. When called upon, they sprung, sprang into action. But on the other hand, watchmen didn't make things happen. They didn't control the rising of the sun. I can't make the sun come up any earlier. This morning I was awoke at 4 o'clock, and all I wanted was two more hours of sleep. It didn't happen. I was praying, let the sun come on up. Or let me fall asleep. Neither one happened. So I waited and I prayed through the night into the morning. They couldn't speed up the process of the dawning of a new day. A watchman knew the difference between his job and God's job. Yesterday, Iran sent rockets into Israel. It was 1,000 miles away. All, it was all night time, their early morning. They're waiting into the early morning night for the rockets to get there. It gave them time to prepare. But the watchmen were waiting, and they were waiting. And 99% of all the rockets sent were knocked down, thank God. Amen. And I, and I mean that because uh, there's something about that little place in Israel and all this thing attacking against it. I know there's a, a, an idea going on now to, to hate them. I don't. I read the Old Testament too much. I see they've always been people against God's people. And eventually, they'll wake up and realize that Jesus is the Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. Waiting reminds us that we're not in charge. I'm, I'm uh, and you, we're the patients. Why do they call us patients? Do you know when you're not feeling well, you are not patient? But you go to a doctor's office and you sit there and you feel, last time I walked in the doctor's office, they had me fill out a stack of paper this thick. They, had to, they said, it's a new year, you've got to start all over. So I had to sign my name and my address and my name and my address and my name. And my, I watched one old man older than me come in and he, he, he was complaining. He was a patient. And he started filling it out. And he said, and he, then he just said the same thing that I was thinking. Why I got to keep repeating myself page after page after page for this? Why can't y'all figure this out and just do last year's? They said, sir, we can't do that. You know what he did? He took that clipboard and threw it through the window. And whatever was wrong with him got well real quick. <laughs> hey, Amen. He was healed by just filling out the paperwork. We're not patient, but I'm in the waiting room, in, in, the, in the real issues of life. I am not just waiting around. I'm waiting on God. Dr. Jesus here. Therefore, I can trust his wisdom and his time. And the person who waits on God loses no time. 
I'm going to say it again. The person who waits on God loses no time. I can wait with confidence because I'm waiting for someone, and that someone is God. Waiting reminds me that I am not God. As a man, I want to fix things. I want to fix my problems, my relationships, my conflicts, my career, my church. What I realize already, I'm saying my because I can't fix yours. Amen. I can't, I can't do it. Fixing and controlling situations and people is like trying to force the rising of the sun. I can't make it happen. From time to time, I have to be reminded that I am not God. Aren't you glad that I am not and you are not God? Oh, my goodness, yes. My job is to be a watchman. I need to have a, a watchman's attitude, a confident and alert expectation that God will do what he said he'll do. Waiting on the Lord allows God to do his work. He told him, wait until you're endued with power from on high. Wait until my coming again. That's what we've been waiting on. Not only do I want to do God's work, but we also want to speed up the process. We're always about process, aren't we? Just speed it up. Oh, now you hurt your arm. Don't you want to be well tomorrow? Absolutely. Amen. We're all that way. We just want things to get better quicker. I understand that the father of the modern day missionary movement, William Carey, and I loved uh, church history, he waited seven years before his first convert in India. As a pastor, I want to speed up the growth process of our church and its ministries. I see much that we could do and should be doing. I see many unmet needs. I see the hurts of people. I drive through our neighborhoods, and I'm bombarded by the thought of many people spending eternity without Christ. I pass by people, and I think, I wonder if they're going to heaven. I wonder if we could reach them. We got a vision in this house from God to, to reach people. We, as a church, we create opportunities like next week, and I want it to be a reality now. And I question God, why, why not now? I've been doing this for 40 years. Why not now? Why not bring it to pass today? God's timing is always the best. In the Old Testament, the book of Habakkuk, the prophet was asking a similar question, and he again used the watchtower model. Hear his dialogue. Habakkuk 2.1, he says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. You ever complained before God? Do you realize it's okay to do it? Quit complaining on Facebook and Instagram and other places. Them people don't want to hear your complaints. Do you know how many people will actually see your complaints and want to really say the truth, but in, because of your feelings, they won't say it? There are times I want to just type something like, <laughs> we'll take that as God telling me not to say it. I just want to say something. Amen. Put, my, put your complaint before God. That's what Habakkuk did here. And he said, the Lord answered me. And he said, write down the vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so that one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It will testify about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it. It's going to delay, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. God is working while we wait. During those times, we patiently wait on God. We know that deep down, He is working while it may be underneath, hidden deep in our character. In due time, God will reveal everything He's grown in us. Those who wait will never be put to shame. <sighs> we'll never be disappointed. I think about, in, in no way is this condescending, but I think about our young ministers like, like, uh, uh, Josh and uh, Bethany, I think about those in the house that are trying to do things that are young, and I realize that for some of you, I got 40 years on you, and I ask myself, what was so important in my life that I was in such a hurry for? Why was I such a, in such a hurry to be a pastor, a youth pastor? Why was I in such a hurry to be an evangelist? Why was I in such a hurry to be a pastor? Why, why am I in such a hurry to go to heaven? Why am I in such a hurry? I just need to sit back and enjoy the day. Amen. And, and not only that, grow in this time when I have time to learn. The, the, the Chinese bamboo. I read this this week, and I'd heard it years ago, but I didn't understand all of it. The Chinese bamboo tree is one of the most remarkable plants on earth. Once the gardener plants the seed, he will see nothing but a single shoot coming out of the bulb for five years. For five years, he will water. He has to, this little shoot. 
this little bit. It's only for five years. I got, what, what you growing there? Chinese bamboo. Well, it was the same size last year. I know. And then three years later, it was the same size. I know. And, and then five years, it's, it's still the same size. Yeah, I know. But what's amazing, after five years, it begins to grow. And in 90 days, it will grow 90 feet. One foot per day, it will shoot up into the air. My question is, when did it grow? During the 90 days or during the five years? Because those five years were so important that that little shoot, though it was just a little shoot in the air, was growing roots deep into the ground to be able to handle the heights that in 90 days it would grow. And many times I see people in business in a hurry to get in business, in a hurry to do certain things in life, but they never grow roots deep enough to handle the height that they're going to grow. And they wonder, why is it I can't handle the height? Because you never took time to grow roots as a father. You never took time to grow roots as a mother. You never took time to grow roots as a businessman or woman. You never took time to grow, grow roots into life as being a grandparent. You know, it takes time to learn how to do you don't You don't get it in a book. I didn't learn in a book how to do funerals. I didn't learn in a book how to do weddings or how, how to give people advice when they're going through it. I didn't learn all that until I started growing in God. And it was the hard times of being stuck down in a, in a motel conference room, amen, and wondering, what's going to happen? Here I am in a motel conference room trying to have church, amen, and nobody showed. We had 50 people. The first time, my first week, pastor, the church, 50 people. All the advertising I can do, got 50 people. The next week, 30. The next week, 20. I said, God, what are you doing? I'm growing your roots, boy. Amen. I'm letting you grow down so you go up. Because a lot of times people grow up, you can't handle the height until your roots get deeper. Can I get an amen? Sometimes you just got to wait. And you look at certain people and go, well, when's it going to happen? When's it going to take place? But then boom, all of a sudden, the growth takes place. It's, it's mind-blowing to think, you know, one foot per day for 90 days, that bamboo shoot will grow up into the air. You know, you can grow a mushroom overnight. Mushy. But it takes years to get a good oak. Wait on God increases our strength. Sometimes I struggle to remember that it is good to wait for the Lord. It isn't easy, but it's good. It goes against the grain of our quick fix society, but there's a hidden benefit in waiting. In times of waiting, my soul is revived and spirit is renewed. I have found out this. The, the older I get, I even hate waiting on the microwave. Seriously, I'll put popcorn in there and stare at it. Come on. You know, you forget the days of putting it on the stove. Amen. Heating it up. Oh, Jiffy Pop. Amen. All those. But we, everything about life is trying to move it faster, faster, faster. And then all it's done is hurt us. It hasn't helped us. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, but those who wait and trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The power of trusting God, and know this, that that word also is, has to do with waiting. When you wait on God, things begin to happen. When you study birds, I was watching yesterday, I found it fascinating. The little baby penguins, them little penguins will fall off a cliff, amen, into the water to learn to swim. Birds, birds are fascinating. Jesus uh, the, the Old Testament tells us we'll have dominion over the birds of the air, the fowl of the air, and that which moves through the sea. But when it comes to birds, they have three types of, of uh, flight. There's flapping. Flapping is keeping their wings in constant motion. It's like a hummingbird. To, to, to counteract gravity, they have to flap. It keeps them in the air. But it's a whole lot of work. Have you ever met a believer that was a flapper? Busy, busy, busy. Just busy. Busy out Martha, Martha. Busy, busy, busy. Just be, not going anywhere, but flapping. Flap, 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 flap. Don't look around. The second is gliding. The second way birds learn to fly is gliding. 
Here the bird builds up enough speed, then coasts downward for a while. Then builds up enough speed and coasts downward for a while. It's much more graceful than flapping, but unfortunately it does not get the bird very far. They go up in the air and they come down a while. And you know, we, we at times are that way. We, we soar on a conference and then we fly back down. We soar on a, on a Sunday, then, but by the time we get to next Sunday... We don't hit the ground. Amen. We're not flapping all week, but we glide. We glide up and we glide down. Amen. It's just the way we've been doing it. But then there's the other way, the third way of sword. And only a few birds, such eagles. We'll read the scripture to you again. Those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles, not, not hummingbirds. Did you know a chicken can glide? I've seen chickens jump up in the air, can't he? Flap their wings and glide back to the ground. Even a chicken can glide, but an eagle are capable of soaring. Eagle's wings are so strong that they are capable of catching rising currents of warm air, thermal winds that go straight up from the earth. And without moving a feather, they can soar to great heights. Eagles have been clocked up to 80 miles an hour without flapping at all. You've got to decide, if I wait on the Lord, I'll be like an eagle. But if I don't wait, I'm just a flapper or at best a chicken. <laughs> I'm talking about the next church. <laughs> you and I in the church will catch a gust of the Spirit. It's what, he, it's what he was asking them to wait on. I want you to wait in Jerusalem till you're empowered. Because you're going to have to preach the gospel. 3,000 was added the first day to the church. It's the beginning of the church. You and I are going to need that kind of a gust. This church is going to need it. It was the gust of the Spirit that disciples in Jerusalem were instructed to wait on. It's the same gust of the Spirit that we need to wait on. And when it comes, hold on. We'll be soaring. God is the great mover. We are to push to work but basically learn to wait in patient trust. Remember that God is in control. Doing his work increases our strength, and we will experience the move of God in our lives, in our church. Listen, God don't think like we do. He doesn't think like we do. You've you got to understand, how is it? His hand, uh, what did Isaiah say? His heart loves us too much to hurt us. His hands were too strong to hurt us, and his mind was too strong to fail us. He brings that out in life. God's idea of waiting the apostle Peter wrote that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. One of our 24 hours is like a thousand years to God. An economist once read those words and he got very excited. And he said, Lord, is it true that a thousand years for us is like just like a minute to you? God said, yes. Then he said, then a then million dollars to us must look like a penny to you. He said, yes. The economist said, Lord, would you give me a penny? And God said, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> He'll explain it to you later, Renee. <laughs> God's ways are not our ways. God told a man to go out and push against a boulder in his front yard. So every morning for the next few weeks, the man went out. And strained against the rock. He pushed and he groaned and he prodded and he shoved, but the rock never budged. Finally, in a fit of exasperation, the man fell to his knees and lifted his eyes toward heaven. He said, God, what were you thinking? Wiping sweat from his brow, he, you told me to push this rock, and I've been pushing it for weeks. I've been praying about it for weeks, but it ain't moved an inch. A voice from heaven rumbled among the clouds, then whispered in the man's ear, I told you to push the stone. I didn't tell you to move it. I'm the only one that can move it. And when you're ready, I will. By the way, look at your hands. The man looked at his hands. They had grown calloused and tough with the work. His arms now bulged with new muscles. Though his efforts seemed fruitless, he had grown strong, and now he was beginning to grow wise. When you pray, you're pushing. 
When you give, you're pushing. When you witness, you're pushing. When you're waiting, you're pushing. And you may not be able to move the rock, but he didn't ask you to. He just asked you to push it. He'll move it in his time. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You've been praying and waiting and praying, but you wanted to give up. The Spirit of God today is telling you you can't do that. You've got too much invested. If you don't grow weary in due season, you'll reap. But it's going to require patient trust. It's going to require knowing that God is in control. Us waiting on the Lord allows God to do His work. And our strength will come through waiting. He left, but He told us to wait here. In waiting, He will endure and give us power. I believe that in Jesus' name. If you've been away from God, would you put your hand up right now? If you've been away from Him, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, again, forgive me. Wash over me. Strengthen me. If you've been waiting on God to do something in your life, would you put your hand up? You've been waiting on something. You've been waiting on healing. You've been waiting on God to heal somebody you've been praying for. Come on, hold that hand up. You've been waiting on finances. You've been a tither for years, and you said, God, I trust you with my giving. I'm believing you to take care of my debt. Give me wisdom. Come on, hold those hands up, Father, in Jesus' name. I pray for every hand that's lifted. As we wait on you, strengthen us. Strengthen us. Help us soar as eagles, not as hummingbirds flapping, not as chickens gliding, but eagles. Well, wait and not be weary. Run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. God, strengthen these mortal bodies. Quicken us. God, quicken these bodies like they've not been quickened before. We need help in these last days. God, at times we get discouraged waiting on you. When are you coming back, Jesus? When are you coming back? War's going on in the Middle East. Evil's going on in America. Looks like Satan's having a heyday. Jesus, the time is right. I sense the time is right that you're coming soon. Help us wait and be strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God's told me I'm going to do a lot more funerals before I go. Mm. There'll be some of my friends from this house and other places, and I will be involved, and I will see people that I love, and I've got to wait. No matter how much I want to go, i got to wait. But my time's coming, too. But until my time gets here, I want to reach as many people as I can for Jesus. I want our young people to know God. I want them to not go through the same mess that we went through. Amen. I want to see them not have to deal with some of the issues in life that we've had to deal with. That they've learned by watching us. That they ain't got to learn through experience. Wouldn't you love to see that more? Amen. I want to see them successful and grow in God. If you need a tithe or offer an envelope, it's a principle we practice biblically. It's in front of you. Would you take it and fill out your tithe or your offering? If you would give a little extra toward muscle car next week. Some of you are going to be working next week. You won't even have an opportunity to tithe. Double up this week. I learned a long time ago, you, you never lose a tithe. I could be out of church for 50 weeks, but I'm going to save up my tithe and make sure my church gets it. I believe in it. On the back table... I need a little help. Uh, next week, we're going to have these bounce houses for the kids. We only have two bounce houses, but they're major bounce houses. I need people to take an hour. I don't care if you're a young person, just somebody that will take an hour and stand there and make, make sure people don't hurt, get hurt inside that house for one hour. That's on the back table. 
If you'd like to help with the Children's Church on the back table, the other ones are just parking at the gate. Bob, you know what you do at the gate? You just smile at the cars when they go by. Amen. I just need some guys to smile at some cars when they go by. So there's some sign-up sheets in the back if you'd like to sign up. Please don't walk up to one of us and go, well, whatever it is you need, we'll do. I'm asking you now. That's what I need. Do. Amen. All right. We're going to have a great day next week. And then we're going to press on through the year. Amen. Our servant leaders are coming up to our guests. Thanks for coming today. Amen. God love our guests. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you have an opportunity. You can be a, uh, a flapper, a glider, a one that waits on him. You ever watch Eagles? Jay and I years ago were heading down the freeway on our Harleys, and an eagle was in the middle of the road. He was just sitting in the middle of the road. He was, he was eating something. And we come up on it, and I didn't recognize it was an eagle. I thought it was a buzzard. And uh, all of a sudden, that thing come up off the ground. And its wings, the wings, the thing had to be 12 foot from tip to tip. And all I heard was, <laughs> I mean, I'm riding a Harley, and I'm hearing, <laughs> I'm thinking, this guy comes with his own exhaust system. And he just started ascending. And, and it just barely got over our heads. And I looked up and I saw that majestic eagle. And as he got up just a little higher, he just kind of cut and started gliding. I thought, my goodness, look at that thing. Gorgeous. Make us like an eagle. Amen. Learn to soar. There's so much about eagles you can preach. There was a lot to it. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. I will see you next. Come on, Joseph. Come on, Pastor Joseph. Come on, come on, come on, Pastor Joseph.